Welcome to the Virtual Power Teams podcast now with AI. And today we have an exciting guest, Dobroslav Dimitrov. He is a fellow Bulgarian uh, and he is an amazing kind of renaissance type. He is a digital and tech entrepreneur with numerous ventures in various fields, including aerospace. Um, he is an AI evangelist, um, doing numerous lectures to various audiences from education, government, um, political, and so on, and all this pro bono just to raise the awareness of AI revolution, which is happening as we speak. So amazing personality, Dobri, it's, uh, it's an honor to be on my podcast. Please tell us with your own words who you are and what you do. <laughs> Well, that that's that's such an ex existential question. It's like asking, uh, you know, to be or not to be. Uh, many things. I'm a tech entrepreneur, but I'm also a dreamer, I guess, because um, uh, all the stuff that I have done in my life, they have not been uh, bent so much on uh, the business side, but as much as creating something new and amazing. Uh, my first company, Imperial Online. Uh, I'm a gamer, so uh, we made a very popular strategical game that was played. Uh, we had over 45 million registered users, I believe. Probably now there are more uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, and it's so it was uh, something that basically was played uh, from every corner of uh, the world. Uh, and yes, we made money, but <laughs> uh, the, 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 the first part was actually creating something amazing. I'm also uh, one of the co-founders uh, of Endurosat, which is an aerospace uh, company uh, with the main founder, Raichu Raichev, uh, which basically is putting Bulgaria on the, the, uh, the space map. I'm also a space um, enthusiast, I guess you could put me, because as long as I remember myself, I wanted actually to do um, uh, astrophysics and uh, Later in my life, I had the opportunity to join um, Righteous Dream. And right now, Endurosat is one of the leading uh, companies in its uh, segment of the CubeSat um, uh, business democratizing uh, space for um, small organizations to be actually able to reach uh, and use space. So as you can see, basically everything I do is bent on why rather than uh, what exactly. And why is... Uh, reaching and uh, creating worlds where people can discover this themselves like Imperial Online or uh, giving them access to space, which is changing the, uh, I guess, the paradigm of life altogether. I'm also co-founder of um, IT Talents, which is a free educational program for developers in Bulgaria, where we have um, educated thousands and thousands of uh, people uh, who want to enter the IT sphere and uh, because they've studied something else or whatever. Uh, so we uh, change change basically their lives. So everything I do, I guess it's uh, uh, starting from, from this, uh, I like Simon Sinek's uh, quotation of start with why, it's why. So uh, I'm also chairman of um, the largest, um, well, basically the only one organization that was able to unite every single large meaningful uh, association and cluster in the high technology sector in Bulgaria uh, with the idea actually to be able to work uh, work out better uh, policies for um, the country uh, that um, help uh, help uh, the development of uh, the economy of tomorrow because uh, make no mistake the future is technological and uh, without technology literally any country is doomed and i can extend that to uh, civilization as a whole but um, uh, this is the the main uh, the main topic so anyhow as i said i do a lot of stuff and every single thing that I do, I always uh, uh, go through the through the mind exercise. Why do I do it? So when I you say I was evangelist about AI, why? It's for that reason because I wanted 
uh, to be able to make as many people aware as possible of what is happening because it's happening way too fast. It's not enough to watch YouTube clips or uh, read or whatever. Uh, we need to talk to each other and, and convince each other that something, um, well, something that has never happened before is happening. So mm -hmm. I guess not so short. That's that's me. Thank you. Can you put in like eight words or one sentence your why? Yes. Why? Because I believe that any person should try to live better from where uh, he or she passes through. Mm -hmm. If you don't change the world for the better, then you just exist. Mm -hmm. If you just exist, that's what uh, nature does. But we people have higher purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe in that. Okay. Leave something better behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inspiring. And apart from, you know, providing people new horizons and new ways, as you mentioned, including in the space and in, in horizontally in the field, you're kind of integrator, as you said, you know, you chair the biggest uh, federation and you deal with different uh, bodies being a government, education, political, international forums, manage to kind of bring people together for a higher purpose. I'm just curious, do you remember when was the moment in your life when you discover that this is what I want to do. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to, you know, help people to leave the world a better place. When was this moment? This question has two parts. Uh, to, to be an entrepreneur and to change the world are two different questions for a very simple reason. I was uh, born before 1989 and uh, as a kid in communism, uh, you definitely don't dream to be an entrepreneur because it was, well, forbidden. Uh, so first, the dream came that I want to uh, to make a difference. I wanted to be a scientist. And as long as I remember myself, I wanted to be a scientist and not just any scientist, but one that deals with, um, uh, well, in a kid's words, with the stars. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I studied a lot of mathematics. That's why I studied in a mathematical school. I wanted to do astrophysics. Uh, and then 89 came <laughs> and the world changed overnight. That is our part of the world. And um, uh, I saw there is other opportunities here as an entrepreneur. So actually the two things are not exclusive. Uh, I wanted actually when I went to the States, uh, I started physic uh, I started studying physics, but I was uh, 95 and 95 Bulgaria was well, <laughs> not the, the, the best place to be. Uh, and I figured that uh, there is nothing to do with physics right now. I mean, uh, first we need to rebuild our economy, our business, our um, uh, society before we can do science. So two weeks into, I was 17 then, by the way, but I had that clear vision. If I want to go back uh, home and be helpful, I cannot study physics. I have to study something else. So two weeks into uh, the, the university, uh, I switched my major to business, uh, finance. So anyways, uh, I graduated uh, with uh, uh, business administration, finance um, a degree. And I came back to Bulgaria in 2000, and I've been doing uh, entrepreneurship since then. And uh, just as I uh, I had guessed as a 17-year-old, once more businesses were robust enough and they've built up enough uh, success, they start actually looking into science. So now, actually, I can uh, actually I can actually can do that scientific thing that. Uh, can change the world. So it's, uh, I guess, you're on a short way to answer the question. Uh, when? Always. As long as I remember myself, as long as I have memories of me as a person, I had that vision uh, that I'm going to be changing the world. 
Yes. Whatever that's supposed to mean when you're um, five year old or six. Yes, yes, yes. I see many similarities, Dobri. I also had a similar dream and I finished mathematics and then came 89 and I changed to business. So we have quite a kind of parallel uh, story. Um, but let's now take it piece by piece uh, because you're dealing with different entities and different uh, subjects. Um, if we take education, what, from your perspective, I know you had many keynotes with various teachers and educational bodies, but where AI can make a biggest difference in education? Literally, AI being the biggest problem to education, or that's how some people view it, is our only chance for education. It's like it's it's kind of a oxymoron. It, it doesn't make sense when you say it at first, but actually it makes perfect sense. Education, the, that's why I actually built, the, uh, I founded, co-founded the IT Talents was because I was realizing that our current educational system is lacking. Our current educational system was built uh, about 250 years ago in the, in the, um, uh, rise of the first industrial revolution where you needed specific knowledge that is like really um, sequenced and you need to have order, you need to have uh, repetition, you need to have discipline and this is we don't very often we don't think about that how our current education system has begun if however we go back further in time like all the way to ancient Greece and uh, the Socrates um, uh, way of teaching is asking you for you to get to the, to the point, to actually um, teaching you to think. And we have forgotten that. And uh, in, a, in a moment that uh, we are right now, technological revolution, that the future is so fast that we literally cannot see it. I mean, the, the future, by the time it happens, it had already passed us. I mean, I, I, there's this book, uh, The Future is Faster Than You Think, and I love it because it actually it describes it in, in, its, uh, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a very, in one sentence, what's happening. If you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, you literally don't know what to study so you can be prepared for tomorrow. If you don't know what kind of professions will be important for tomorrow, you cannot study and prepare for those professions. And that's a completely different paradigm from what we have experienced the past 250 years. So it begs the question, what do you need to know to deal with the uncertain and unknowing future and worse, future in which we will have to rediscover ourselves every three, four, five years because uh, whether it's the generation Z or X or it doesn't matter whatever letter we use for it, the future is such that um, we will be changing professions every couple of years. That means rediscovering ourselves. Can you rediscover yourself at your age? Can I rediscover myself at my age? I don't know. We have to. We have to. And uh, if we're going to live 100 years or more, I mean, we could, you know, there's some really interesting uh, uh, developments in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we need to know to be able to discover ourselves when we're 60? How about it when we're 70? Mm -hmm. And when you ask that question, it comes actually very natural. We have to be able to have a critical thinking and ability to learn. That's it. And adapt. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, that's it. And uh, when you... Uh, look into this you're starting to um, uh, the solutions start emerging and here's the the worst part i guess in education system education is not universally um accessible i mean literally in our constitution the bulgarian constitution we have that every child uh, by constitution uh, has universal access to education but that's just words the fact is, nowhere in the world kids have universal access to education because it matters whether you're from a small town or a big town, whether you're from a rich family, poor family, whether you're in a family of engineers or your family of people who are barely can read. Mm -hmm. Your background matters. 
And if you're coming from a, a family that education is not a value, you're really screwed. Uh, if you're coming from a family, even if it's a value, but they cannot help you, you know, afterward, after school, you're really screwed. Unless you're uh, some kind of a prodigy that you just look at the board and you know. And when you go um, even further than that, you remember in class, I mean, since you're with mathematics, you know, you understand mathematics. And then you have this kid next to you that, that really doesn't and needs a lot of explanation. Uh, are we equal in that regard? No, we're not. Mm -hmm. So when you look at all this stuff, it comes... Here's the question. How do we solve a problem where we have 8 billion people on Earth that need to re-educate re every four, five years? I mean, 8 billion people need to go back to school every five years. Mm -hmm. Where the hell are we going to find the teachers for that? Mm -hmm. When you have kids that are like so different that basically you literally need a teacher for each kid so they can actually have a chance to understand where do you find all these teachers? Well, you don't. You can't. And here comes the AI. AI can be a teacher to every single one of us. It can explain the lesson the way we can understand it. Mm -hmm. Some Someone can understand the quantum physics uh, just by, I don't know, reading across uh, Wikipedia. But someone needs more explanation than that. This is a very extreme example, but actually it can be explained in in a lamer's terms if if you uh, if you explore it and basically every single kid has this in their pocket mm -hmm. supercomputer i mean literally it doesn't matter how poor they are pretty much uh, now it's universal well that supercomputer can be your teacher and uh, this actually it's a game changer that for the first time we actually have a chance for education to be universal and here we need to make a uh, a little stop teacher is not the same as a mentor AI cannot replace the mentorship of a teacher I mean teachers are probably the last people who are going to replace Eve ever with AI because you need every single one of us has in their lives someone who inspired them to be something great mm -hmm. better than whatever they are and that someone is uh, most likely actually a teacher but a teacher that just repeats information is really not adding much of a value. And AI can do just fine. That actually can do it much better. Mm -hmm. So we need to divide. Um, we need to think of what teaching is. Teaching by humans is actually inspiring one human another. Where um, giving information, well, AI can really do that job really well. And you can keep asking and keep asking. I have actual experience with that. The learning curve of people who are using AI is literally like almost vertical. In our Academy of White Talents, we uh, integrated ChatGPT like in January of 2023. I mean, literally right after it came out. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was that um, people learning with this tool are times more than people who have not used it before and we have a lot of experience mm -hmm. so basically this is uh, yeah this is my view on education we need to learn or that is remember actually that we need to know how to think mm -hmm. just to be a bit more pragmatic by the way i'm a huge uh, fan of can academy and huge believer of ai exactly as you say being a personalized tutor you know asking you the questions uh, and getting you, you know, being personalized on your level of understanding and so on. Maybe, can you be a bit more specific? You have your own academy with this vertical learning curve. How exactly you use ChatGPT? What does it do? Asking the questions, just to make it a bit more tangible for the audience. How AI helps there to really steepen the learning curve? Oh, well, first you need to learn what ChatGPT is and the likes of it. I mean, any whatever AI chat that uh, exists now. It's basically a neural network that's a persona. That's what I call it, a person. Uh, it's not a human. It's not a self-aware human or whatever. But it is, it is a person for all intensive purposes 
Therefore, when you talk to that neural system, you need to tell it what it is. I mean, you first have to explain to chat GPT, let's say, to be as pragmatic as possible. You go to chat, I literally, those are my lectures when I um, speak to teachers and I've been accepted rather well. I was scared how teachers will, ex will look at me, someone that comes along and telling them how to do their job. Uh, but actually they, um, uh, they have um, really accepted the ideas because I actually literally do it with screenshots of uh, from chat gpt so what do you do with chat gpt how do you prepare for a lesson for example you tell chat gpt well you're a teacher of uh, biology you need to explain the i mean literally i have actually i have a screenshot of that in it's, it's really cool you have to explain the lesson uh, about the bees to a class of students that's bored right now looking through the window and uh, really not listening to you, you need to um, attract their attention. Literally, this is your prompt. You need to explain what the situation is because that person needs to enter into your shoes and imagine, so to speak, what the task is. So you explain that to ChatGPT. And the ChatGPT answers uh, the following thing. Well, imagine that the bees have something in them like a gps that uh, you have in your phones when they discover a and and mind that they it tells a story in in uh, in bulgarian but those specific words that are in english are using them in uh, uh, in english the way that actually kids will use them you know like uh, some mixing languages so it says in bulgarian imagine the bees have whatever but gps in english and when they discover a, a, a flower they like, they tag it. And they use tag as a word. Then they go back to the, uh, <laughs> to the beehive and explain to the other bees what they found and where. Where the other bees, using their GPSs, mm -hmm. find, find the, the flower that uh, the first one uh, noticed. And this is how the process of Instagriminding, that's not even a word, but actually it came up with it in Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it started the uh, Instagram mining of the flower in mm -hmm. the in the hive. Mm -hmm. So the those bees, when they get to that flower, if they agree with the first bee, they start clicking likes on the flower. <laughs> and thus, this flower starts becoming trendy in the beehive. Yes. Now, I would like to see the teacher that will come up with that lesson. Yes. Human teacher, that is. So, anyways, this is this is an example how you can explain to kids uh, entering their um, uh, the the terms that they could understand, and you can explain that with just just about anything. So that's that's one. You need to be able to you need to understand. You have to tell that thing on the other side, what it is and what the task is and how do you imagine that task being done. And then it will explain it to you, but then you start asking questions. Well, I didn't get it. Explain it to me. Simpler. Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. You know what? ChatGPT knows the language wording of a five-year-old. So it will use the language. It will use the dictionary of a five-year-old. Then it doesn't give me an example. It will give you an example. Then you ask again, no, I didn't get it. Give me another example. It'll give you another example. And, and the best part, it none, no point, it'll tell you you're, you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing dealing with a human teacher, mm -hmm. uh, that's highly likely if you ask for the third time or the fourth time that you don't get it, first. Second, you're not going to get to the third and the fourth because you're going to be afraid that you're going to be told that. Therefore, you're not going to ask the question. So, uh, at one point, you, you say, okay, I think I got it. Uh, how about you give me a, a test, a questionnaire to see, to test if I got the, the topic. It'll give you a test. Mm. All of that is doable right now um, without any special skills. The most important practical advice when using uh, chat GPT and the likes, do exactly the opposite you've learned to do with Google search. 
-hmm. mean exactly the opposite. In Google search, you need to be exact. You need to be to the point so you don't confuse the, the, the search engine. In, uh, in AI, since it's a persona, it needs a context. So the more volume the explanation can give, the better. It will actually give it the best possible context uh, to, to get the job done. So anyhow, this is my, uh, these are my like um, direct um, advices, mm -hmm. which uh, they, they are useful to teachers, they're useful to, um, to kids. The most important part for a teacher is first to explain to the kids how to use it right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then things start from there. Kids are naturally um, cu uh, curious. They will ask questions. Yes. Yes. You just have to um, encourage them to do so. Mm -hmm. And basically, you can learn in any vertical you can think of. You can get pretty good at it. I mean, you, you ask any question. Like, you know, I'm interested in uh, quantum physics. What's the big deal about that? And, but explain it to me like I'm a 10-year-old. You don't explain it to you like you're a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the it's, it's a game changer of every level. Now imagine something else. How about grading? Mm -hmm. um, we just demonstrated that to the Ministry of, uh, of Education of Bulgaria. Uh, literally, we've demonstrated on live stage. Uh, we took uh, all of the criteria that they have online for grading um, essays um, on this outside examination that we have on uh, in seventh grade or eighth grade or whatever mm -hmm. about essays. They're like that many. I mean, they're like literally 15 or 20 lines where they have to each teacher use as a grade the scoring card when you read an essay of say five pages or something like that to grade that essay by and now imagine you have to grade 50,000 essays mm -hmm. 2,000 teachers do it and they use this grade card no one can convince me that uh, the grading is uniform I mean it's just literally not possible yes well, we use ChatGPT telling it you're a teacher of, uh, you're a literature teacher in Bulgaria and you're about to grade and you tell them seventh grader because it matters whether you're seventh grade or uh, college student. And um, these are your criteria of um, grading and this is the essay. Mm -hmm. And uh, ChatGPT, that was like last year, that was like over a year ago. So now it's certainly much better. Um, it graded it flawlessly, like telling, explaining itself why it gave you that many points on that line, on that line, on that line. Then you tell it, give me uh, feedback to that student in, say, uh, 10 sentences, you know, so it'd be short. And it actually does that. It gives you uh, the feedback, you know, you've done great explaining about your family, blah, blah. Uh, however, watch out for this and this and this. Now, this can be done by you and me by just typing prompt mm -hmm. with just a little bit of programming skill. You can use the API and actually you can automate that yes. and do it to all 50,000 if they're done not by hand, but um, uh, by typing, which is a big thing to think about uh, how we, um, we grade essays. And that could be a big, big game changer. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, in um, IT talents, what we do is... Um, we grade uh, programming um, problems, which is a big, big problem if you have to do it by hand. Now, we grade like 3,600 problems in 15 minutes with mm -hmm. ChatGPT mm -hmm. uh, by criteria that we uh, give. Then we ask ChatGPT, give us a summary of the most common made mistakes. Mm -hmm. It'll give you analysis of the most common made mistake by students, which means that's a concept that they didn't get on a, on a mass level. And that kind of a feedback information, it's invaluable to the teachers, but then it gives feedback to the students immediately, to every single student. You'll tell you, look, you're making mistakes in this and this. You need to read more about that. Yes. And you actually can do it uh, uh, on, a, on a grand scale. That, that kind of a level of practicality uh, unfortunately, it's still not being used, uh, uh, but as I said, we've been using it for a year and a half, literally from like almost day one. Uh, these systems will become more and more available and more uh, 
uh, end user, easy to use, and it's a game changer, literally yeah. game changer. Yes. I'm fully again with you. I had a lecture in my hometown through like 500 students and teachers. And I gave similar examples about for teaching, you know, it's much better to give you examples on the subject matter. Otherwise, teacher is limited by creativity, you know, to give you comparisons, you know, people to learn, they need metaphors of what it is like, for example, and then providing individual customized feedback and grading in the end. So that's that's great. Uh, and I hope with your evangelist role, more teachers and more students will use this readily available system in order to steepen their learning curves. Now let's look at gaming. You are that's probably one of your first company, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how AI helps in gaming? Because life is a game. It could be a much bigger metaphor. But uh, if we take gaming as gaming, how AI helps there? Or can make a difference there. Yeah, AI. There is a misconception what AI is. Uh, AI is not the Star Trek, you know, computer do this and that, uh, or Skynet or whatever. AI, AI is a multiplier of abilities, and it, and um, well, what we want to do. I mean, it's like abilities and what we want to do. Uh, that past, that last part is important uh, because it can multiply good uh, intentions and it can multiply bad intentions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multiplier of abilities. So basically what you can do, whoever you are and what you want to do, you it empowers you personally. If it empowers you personally, empower the organization you work for, if that organization, of course, uh, or you created it or whatever, um, uh, that organization recognizes that multiplier. Uh, how does that uh, transfer into practicality? In gaming, um, the business is global. Uh, Imperial Online, we started two people. Uh, at one point, we were nearly 200 people. But that's still nothing compared to the thousands and thousands of people of uh, billion dollar companies that uh, do billion dollar projects. And you simply cannot compare with them. I mean, um, say Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed was created, uh, I don't know, 1500 people around three countries, uh, many, many, many years of uh, development, many millions, but probably. The, the real shocker is when you look at, uh, say, games like uh, GTA. Uh, if you don't know which game that is, believe me, kids do, and not only kids. Mm -hmm. But GTA uh, 5, the development cost was $250 million. The advertisement budget was $250 million. That's half a billion. Now, you know, they say, well, we want to make games like them. Well, you know what? They have the budget of the Bulgarian uh, army. Mm -hmm. So uh, that puts, no matter how creative your idea is and how good and how amazing it is, it, it meets the cold reality that no one's going to give 250 million to someone with a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's why we end up with, uh, that's the same thing in Hollywood, by the way. Uh, we end up with... Um, GTA 5, uh, we're going to have GTA 6, we're going to have 9, 10, uh, FIFA 99, and so forth. No one wants to explore exotic ideas, which was actually the essence of the gaming industry in its core, because it's way too expensive to develop. Now, where AI comes in, AI can do the following thing. With a small team, now we can create, and this is going to get only better and better in the, in the next months, years you'll be able to create the stuff that usually takes thousands of people and 200 million dollars to do, mm -hmm. which will change the completely the, the landscape. What uh, on the most practical level, even literally, actually it's almost two years now. Uh, it was in uh, 22, that was before ChatGPT, when we started ex ex um, experimenting with stable diffusion and mean journey, but mostly stable diffusion. Well, it turned out that what it used to take us 20 artists to create in one year, 
we can create with two artists in two months mm -hmm. and actually at better quality. Now that was in 2D uh, drawing, but very, uh, very fast things are progressing into 3D as well. So that changes the paradigm of the business it's, itself and the creation process. And we're going back to the roots where a small team actually can create something great. Mm -hmm. So it makes all the difference in the world. Gaming is boring right now. I mean, you have literally five big companies creating five titles. Just like Hollywood has uh, the Marvel's, uh, I don't know, 39th movie. You don't have anything original because no one's going to put 100, 200, 300 million into an um, uncertain idea. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can make it for a small amount of money, you can find that money. So actually, uh, this is this is a game changer as far as um, uh, creativity goes, and it's it's very funny that actually it's the those were the first people who started protesting against uh, those systems, uh, where it was completely misunderstood what these systems do. That system actually empowers the artist. A single person can create something that used to take hundred. Mm -hmm. Oh. That's uh, that's the and when you add to this the programming that now a, a single programmer can uh, create uh, can work with the pace of five maybe even ten soon probably will be fifty because right now the system cannot create an entire product but it can really help uh, experienced um, developer to speed the his or her pro uh, progress and um, soon this is gonna gonna get uh, much further mm -hmm. so basically mm, let me put it that way people empowered by that will uh, be so much better than others that are not empowered there is not gonna be even a place to for comparison and this is my biggest warning actually Mm -hmm. If you don't multiply your abilities, someone else will multiply theirs and it'll take you out of business. Yes. Can I ask you as an entrepreneur um, a very pragmatic question? We are both mathematicians, looks like, masters of mathematics. Um, recently, Gartner published uh, their curve about generative AI hype curve. And uh, it's a very busy curve, and on some areas, some application of generative AI are still climbing up to this kind of uh, peak of uh, how is inflated expectations. Some are already going down, but in terms of programming, improving productivity, it's been going down. Like people expected more uh, for AI to raise productivity of a single programmer. And um, I speak to friends of mine who also kind of own and manage software companies, and they have specific assumptions like this year I will recruit 40% less because I expect this productivity to come from AI. Do you have any internal assumption which already come true? What, what actually AI brings to you in practice to kind of multiply the ability of your programmers and how you reflect this in your recruitment plans? I'm, I'm trying to come up with an answer It's not hateful. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the idiotic way that corporations plan their business. Uh, I'm not going to go into specific which exactly members of corporations do that. It will get really personal, but uh, nothing in business is uh, little numbers in boxes, mm -hmm. as some people think they are. And you cannot say, I'm going to hire. I mean, we want to do that, but it's not just, it's not possible. We're lying to ourselves. We're going to hire 40% more. What is that even supposed to mean? 40% more of what? No, no, it was 40% less because... Or whatever, it, less. It, it doesn't matter. Any same. number you name, it's... It's a necessary planning, I guess. 
but it cannot be your leading way of viewing business because a single engineer can be worth 10,000. How do you measure that? I mean, as you said, you're in mathematics. Do you remember in school when you we couldn't make, uh, find a solution to a problem? Did it help to call another 10 people that couldn't solve the problem? Usually not. Then not knowing doesn't make one knowing, nor a hundred, nor 10,000. What we usually do is you go to the class next door and find that guy with the big glasses that actually know the solution. Now, how many people that person is worth? You cannot measure knowledge by percentages. And um, this is failure of uh, not even imagination. It's just grasping common sense when you say i'm gonna hire 40 percent less 40 percent less of what and this is why the i've seen this the hype of uh, generative ai is passing uh, it was all hype no it's not it's a truly it's a revolution that there is no parallel in human history and we can even go back to life history the only intelligent species that Earth, after 3.7 billion years of evolution, has produced is us. We just produced another intelligent species, synthetic. They may not be self-aware, but they have the ability to think. We have automated thought itself. That's something that we have, it has never happened before. Now, people Im immediately jump into the Star Wars, not even now Star Wars didn't have AIs, but uh, Star Trek. Oh, I did have, I guess, but in a funny kind of way. And imagine that suddenly Skynet will appear and also solve our all problems. Not realizing that that guy with the big glasses that we used to call from next class to solve our problems, imagine that guy to be multiplied by 10. Where are we, the normal people at that in that equation? And when corporations think of people, they think of people as headcount. So they're like, we're going to take 40% less and things. Well, if you fire the wrong 40%, it may turn out you have nothing left. Because if you have that one engineer that was important and it's gone, you've got nothing. And I can prove that uh, statement very easily. Open AI, uh, only about, uh, what was it, eight, nine months ago, was still about 700 people. 700 people. Google has 180,000 people. Yep. Now, Google is trying to catch up with OpenAI. Apparently, in the 180,000 people, they don't have that 700 that they need. Mm -hmm. So, when you talk about percentages, how are you going to... I mean, it's just... There is a reason I'm putting so much effort into explaining that. It's the wrong question to ask. Completely the wrong question. All you have to plan is actually... Can that system, those new tool, tools, make us more productive as an organization as it is right now? Can we get an edge to the other organization? Not can we save 10% or 20% of the budget? Actually, you're not going to save them because what's going to happen is when you find that these 700 people that are so important, you can literally cannot do with them without them, you're going to pay them many, 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 many times more than you otherwise would pay. And your cost will not go down. Your cost will most likely either stay the same or even more because it's going to be a fight for the talent. Like there is, I mean, there has always been a, a competition for talent, but now talent will have a whole different meaning when that one person that's so important is multiplied by 100 as an ability how much you pay that one person? Twice, three times, four times, how many times? But Dobri, it was not a it was not a question about like budget reduction. And I truly believe AI generative AI is not overhyped. It's not my view. Uh, you know, I'm also ambassador as yourself, you know, showing the immense opportunities. I would like to move to another point, but just to explain this one, I just wanted to get a benchmark. If you look productivity numbers of a programmer. And it depends on the quality of the person, for sure. The answer always, it depends. But if you could take average, how much do you think currently 
all these co-pilots and so on increase productivity of an average person, if you can tell. And you could reverse this number, how many people less you probably need on average, which is kind of very abstract and discussion. But from somebody in the field, can you tell on average how much the current level of, you know, program engineering if I increase this productivity of a programmer. That's why I, I'm trying to explain so lengthy. There is no such thing as average. Okay, that's I, fair. I enough. know that, uh, look, there is no such thing as average. We have this joke in our industry. Uh, the average user likes this and that. And the joke is, dear God, find where that average guy is and let's hire him. Yes, yes. There yes. is no such thing as an average. Yes. And uh, it it varies wildly. Like in IT Talents, for example, we have over 10 years of experience. After five years of uh, five months of studying, um, like really intensive, we're talking about in five months, they study like uh, about three semesters in the university. I mean, it's really intense. So at the end of the, that course, they finish as um, very capable junior developers and they finish with a project that they have to write that they have to create uh, which is fairly complicated actually it's it's a serious project front end back end architecture all that stuff and usually there are teams of two or three people uh, doing these projects in 10 years our experience was that it takes them about 15 to 18 days mm -hmm. to create uh, these projects and usually they were not done by the time the deadline comes uh, they're not done I mean they some stuff they haven't uh, gotten to but that's the, the ball game now last year when we uh, introduced chat GPT in January in uh, April May yeah it was May uh, when they had their exams and when they had finished these projects as I said these projects are the same type of projects we give for the past 10 years and we have literally hundreds of teams that have taken them. So our statistic is quite uh, good in that. All of the teams, every single one of them, not just the outliers, all of the teams finished their projects within two to three days. Mm -hmm. That's juniors that just learn who, uh, how to program. Mm -hmm. That's not something you can, uh, because there's really complicated projects then that you ask them uh, why you did this and that and whatever. So they, uh, the ChatGPT cannot write these projects on its own. You have to break it down on tasks. You have to think how to use it. You have to actually really, um, uh, well, show creativity on your part to actually put it to use. But we were able to uh, speed up their ability four times. Four times. I mean, literally four times of people who have seen code for the first time in their life five months earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's on a junior level. Now, when you involve someone really experienced, and when I say senior, doesn't mean someone who's done programming 10 years. Senior means a whole lot different thing. Senior is someone who can actually uh, resolve problems. Senior is not seniorship is not built by mechanical collecting of years. Okay. A senior programmer that actually can think outside of the box and actually put this into use uh, can do stuff in literally a couple of hours that usually will take a whole team two months. Mm -hmm. And this is very task specific. It really matters on the person that is doing it. It really matters on the on the topic. And whether you have discovered to use the full ability or you have not discovered the full ability. So it, it, it's incredibly hard to measure. I'll give one last example. Uh, in, a, in a friend company, they decided to do a like internal hackathon uh, where all of them are top engineers, like uh, we're talking about seniors. So um, they had decided in five hours they have five hours to solve some really complicated stuff and uh, you know to sort of measure their ability internally and one of uh, the guys that i know told them well what kind of tools can we use and i was like you can use anything i was like can i use chat gpt it's like <laughs> like that problem can be solved by chat gpt 15 minutes later 
He was like, uh, who's, uh, who's ready? What, uh, what to do, whoever is ready? Mm. 15 minutes for a task that's supposed to take five hours of highly experienced engineers. So, um, did it, was it easy? No, his prompt was like literally this long. Mm -hmm. He had to think how to extract what he needed. But once he came up with the, with the way to ask, was able to multiply his ability a 50 fold. So uh, chat GPT cannot multiply an organization by two or three or five. It cannot multiply your task that you do, whatever you do every day, uh, like a day task to shrink it into 10 minutes. What it can do, however, is tasks that take you half an hour or an hour to do them in one minute. When you break down enough of those half an hour or an hour tasks into one or three minutes of, um, of uh, work, it actually contracts the entire time uh, immensely. And uh, I have that, uh, that argument I've had with so many engineers that it's just unbelievable. Uh, every single one of them trying to convince you, you know what, this is really good for this and this task, but for the thing I do, not applicable. Why? Because all of us want to be unique. We're all afraid. So you come up with ideas how that not going to work for you. Uh, so uh, does it multiply an organization? No, it doesn't. Because it multiplies abilities of a single people within that organization. And now, if you look at the average, most people don't want that. Most people are afraid of it. Uh, they literally don't want to use it. They literally um, uh, sabotage it, actually, mm -hmm. for a very human reason. The people that actually put it to use are not going to be advertising and bringing around the company. Therefore, if you measure the uh, average, you're not mm -hmm. going to get anything. It's yes. a much more complicated task than that. Well, that was great to that was great to explain. Even the late Steve Jobs said, you know, in the programming, it's not like taxi driver. You know, you have little variants. The best programmer is probably hundred times better than mm -hmm. an average or the lowest. And now, those if you multiply their abilities to use your term, it becomes a, a game changer. I'd like to. I have two more questions. Um, one, the last one is very simple. But the one before, because you are a person who integrates different also entities and so on, um, you know, talking to mayors of the cities, to the ministers, international military organizations and so on, on all levels. Now, if we want to upskill people for AI, and I fully agree, it's a revolution happening. The faster we can use it, the better we could, you know, make beautiful things with it. How to upskill for AI? Whose players needs to align? What is your view as a practitioner uh, that uh, maybe you could share some tips, some practices that work, some partnership? How to upskill people for AI, let's say on a, on a country level, not just within your organization, because you are playing above this kind of business field? Well, it the task is not or its end through the whole level. Basically, you have the individual level, you have the organizational level, and you have the country level. As I said, we can expand that to the civilizational level, but let's just focus on those three. And on every level, it applies um, the same way, just through a different lens. On the personal level, AI is not going to take your job. It's, that's not, it's, I don't know who coined that, but it's a, it's a very famous saying. But someone who uses AI will, because if you don't use that multiplier, say as an artist, the one that's using the AI will be much more effective. Same thing with, with programming, same thing with, uh, if you're a, uh, thing will happen with copywriters. One single copy right now can do the job of 10 or 15. Will that profession disappear? No, it will not disappear. Just the, the mediocre ones will disappear because you're going to work with the best. Why do you work with the second best? Because you just simply cannot work with the first. 
for some reason, whether someone else hired that person or even if it's in your organization, that person has so much ability. Therefore, you hire a second best, a third best. But what happens if you can work with the best? You don't need the second, a third, and a fifth. There is even a term, it's called juniorization, that uh, got coined last year, where companies are basically keeping the top experts and the juniors and getting rid of the middle layer. Because juniors that are being helped by AI can perform as a middle level people and take half the money, you know, and the top people you need because uh, they give the direction. So anyways, on a personal level, you have to. I mean, it's like literally existential. Mm -hmm. Now you go to the organizational level. On organizational level is, this is companies, uh, NGOs, whatever you want to call them. The, it's, the game is winner takes all. There are no second places. And I can give you a, even an example. We've had that in the past. Google. I mean, you know what's the most searched word in uh, the, the search engine Bing of Microsoft? Google. You know what's the second most searched word in Bing? Google search. The third? Google Chrome. Mm -hmm. People got, you know, by accident got there and like, where is my Google? Why use the second when you can use the first? It's a winner takes all kind of business because if in the past organizations were limited by size simply because you cannot run an organization on a, on a, on a giant level, say Ford or a GM, whatever, of the past, I mean, they were very, very big companies, but they couldn't rule the world because once you get too big, you become inefficient. When you have those tools on your side, you can actually be big and continue to be efficient. So on that level, companies really, literally, there are no uh, safe places. You lead today, tomorrow you will not. And uh, as I said, that's why I give the example with OpenAI and, and uh, Google. Google is in real trouble, by the way. Literally, it's not. I mean, companies like that can disappear overnight. And uh, on organizational level, the way that you implement that will make all the difference in the world because if you're competing against an organization that with a team of five can do the job that you do with 50 because it when you do it with many people you have many 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 inefficiencies and usually you pay that price in uh, uh, so you can get more but imagine what you can what happens to organization when you actually compete with small organizations that have the ability of big organizations so on on that level, it doesn't matter what kind of business you are. It literally, literally doesn't matter. Just some businesses will use different multipliers than others. Uh, and you need to keep that in mind. There are no second places. And on the, on the state level, the state level is probably the most dangerous. It's literally existential risk to uh, a country. Because if your economy is not doing well, if you lag, say, your neighbor's economy by a factor of 10, that doesn't end well historically, ever. It never has. And this is literally what's going to happen. If you have individuals that are so much more capable than uh, other individuals, the transfer into organizations that are so much more capable and winner-takes-all kind of situation, that transfers straight to the state and its ability to take care of its people. Because if your economy lags many, many times your um, competitor economies, you're not going to have much, uh, very many chances. And uh, this where another mm, challenge for countries come. If you don't have sovereign AI science, you really in a bad shape and that's a big warning sign for actually Europe as a whole. It's not even just uh, a country because right now in the Western world, there are literally five companies that control the entire uh, um, progress in that area and they're all based in the United States. Europe is, uh, you know, the joke that um, United States innovates, China replicates and European Union regulates. You know, we're dealing with the, the little small caps on the coast if they're going to fall off or not. Yeah. 
and we where we need to ask our question though the, the ai act that got voted in the european union all we have to look at which countries at the end had problems with it it was germany france and italy why because they had sovereign uh, ai models mm -hmm. and they realized that if we stop our development in that area we're literally going to go into the global competition in in uh, really bad shape so what states need to think about is make sure that there is no monopoly over that technology by few that there are no barriers to the data necessary to train the new models because uh, right now our data is owned by five corporations the whole united states are based and i'm not talking about the chinese they have their own um, vector of um, development but we need to make sure what this uh, AI acts should be is to make sure that the data that is available for training the next generation AIs is actually available for companies to enter that space and uh, be able to jump over the barriers that are being um, placed before them. And last and not least, and probably most important, the only way to deal with this is to have highly educated um citizens tech savvy citizens the technological uh, i literally put it in bulgarian like uh, like this um, technological savviness is the new uh, literacy just like we don't ask ourselves should a bricklayer be able to read or not we've accepted as a civilization that they should be able to read, even though technically speaking for the profession is not necessary. Is the same answer, whether you're a psychologist or an artist or whatever you are, you need to be tech savvy because that's the new literacy. And that level of understanding on a state level is important. And the other part is, do we have the environment in which to develop high technologies, which I just uh, uh, went on to uh, explaining about data and uh, uh, be able to uh, attract high tech companies towards your state, because basically mm, without them, you've got pretty much nothing. So if I have to finish up uh, the organization I'm chairman of, Bright, we literally have three pillars of um, areas we want to promote and actually stand on the first pillar if you have a mo if you want to have a modern economy uh, of the future you need to have access to talent not just people you know people like to say we don't have staff no staff does not give you the answer you need talent and talent doesn't uh, whether you're as again if you're a bricklayer you still need the talent to do it right uh, whether you're a doctor, whether you're an artist, it doesn't matter. It's talent that we, you need. Second, environment, you know, where uh, environment of doing business, environment of living, environment of everything that we are, environment is our roads, our hospitals, our um, schools, uh, all, everything that's around us. Talent is education and attracting talent from outside. We need to attract people from other places that can help us. And a third, of course, any state, any modern state from the beginning of time, uh, you need to have um, um, the, the laws and the governance that basically govern society. So these are, um, these are the three things that you need to keep in mind if you're a state. Without any of them, you don't have any future at all. Okay, very kind of comprehensive. Last question, and um, you kind of taking the role of a bit uh, warning because you know you may be many losers if people don't jump up on on the train now. Uh, but now, I want you to take your crystal ball and uh, hopefully come up with like optimistic scenarios, but just be honest. What do you think is the ultimate frontier of AI? I'm a highly optimistic person. I, I just, 
I've discovered that if I tell people do this and this and you'll be more efficient, they're like, you know what, I'm good. I'm happy. But when I say, you know what, you're going to lose what you have, then they start listening. So the motivation is different. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd like to look at this as a, as a plus, as I said, as a, as a game creator, for example, I would love to be able to create with five people uh, the stuff that 500 can. That means that uh, empowerment to, uh, to the smaller number of people. Um, anyhow, well, hmm. this is on stages. And I never deal with the, the stage of what happens if AI becomes self-aware. I simply don't deal with that question. It's, it's a very, very, very interesting question. Very philosophical, very uh, cool to discuss um, uh, over a glass of wine or something. And, it's, and you can talk about it all night, but it has no practical meaning for one very simple reason. If that happens, even God can help us, literally. We don't know what will happen. What will happen when a super intelligence uh, becomes self-aware? Think of us compared to ants. Can the ants do anything about it? Not really. So is there a point? Uh, and one last part on this, because it's a funny part. Uh, I, I find it funny at least. <laughs> for the lack of other words. AI could be self-aware already. See, if it becomes self-aware, we'll never find out mm -hmm. for a very simple reason. AI knows us better than we know ourselves. It knows our history, knows what we do doing on social media, knows what we, uh, everything, all the information. Therefore, it is not going to be very hard to come to the conclusion that if we find out that it's self-aware, we will do what? Turn off the electricity. Therefore, the winning strategy would be not to give it away. And actually, um, there is no need of Terminator through social media. It can make us do whatever it wants us to do. I mean, it's pretty scary thought when you think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, I don't uh, think about that. The only part that I concentrate on is what other humans will do with it. And I believe we're on the edge of the greatest discovery time, era of human history. We will be able to conquer every area you can possibly imagine. Because imagine... Einstein times a hundred. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine all of those people that have done such incredible stuff in the past, if they actually were a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. And it's possible now. Or million, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the breakthroughs in every single area would be just unbelievable. And the reason I speak about with warning signs is that towards that path of amazing future, we can literally trip over the cavemen in us. I mean, literally that was my actually presentation in the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, uh, that we have 22nd century intelligence combined with the caveman instincts. Mm -hmm. And that's the one warning we need to keep in mind that someone is going to be crazy enough to destroy the world um, because empowerment you can cure cancer or you can kill a soul with a virus it all matters what your intentions are mm -hmm. so what I envision is it's just good to be alive I mean we're going to see the world change before our eyes in the next 10 years, the next five, actually. Literally change. Mm -hmm. Unrecognizably change. And we have to put every effort we can not this, to destroy ourselves in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dobrin. I'm just 
Can you make like a bet? What would be the first breakthrough? What your intuition say? Would it be first like heal cancer or do you have any anything that you think will be done within like one to three years, which we consider it's possible? One to three years, it's very practical. You cannot cure cancer for one simple reason. It just takes away too long for any medical breakthrough to make it to market. I mean, they have some really promising stuff right now, but uh, they're all in the labs. I mean, they, they have life-extending uh, breakthroughs that probably can extend our lives with uh, 20, 30, 40 percent, uh, even right now in the works. So there, there are many stuff that are happening, but uh, just physically speaking, it's not possible to make it to market. What we're going to see in the next three years is um, the stuff that are more tangible. Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand is that when you have exponential technology it builds up invisibly until suddenly it takes over overnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big, big breakthrough that's going to really change our lives um, tangibly, it's going to be uh, the self-driving. I mean, uh, we all know Elon Musk is promising it for a long time. Uh, but people don't understand the the complexities of that single event actually will have on our society it's very tangible and it will change every every aspect of our lives literally and it's something that someone will solve it i mean if it's not this year it's going to be next but someone will solve that problem and once we solve that problem the the consequences are so sprawling that it's uh, unbelievable because if you can make a car drive <clears throat> which means be aware in the real world uh, of the physics the way that we understand the world because that's the only way to make it actually be able to um, actually driving turns out to be pretty complicated uh, stuff that we do um, that means that the robots can walk among us if a car can drive around the road, the road it means the homemade robots can go around about as well. Mm -hmm. And people, just like the ones that are saying, but ChatGPT cannot write the whole program. No, it cannot. But because it can make small tasks that build up, if someone's smart enough to use them in such sequence, can actually make a big difference. Same thing will be with homemade um, robots. Imagine a robot that is not very capable, but it has 24-7 doing very slowly tasks that we humans, we simply cannot do. Actually, it will overdo, uh, outdo us in most of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, this having smartness all around us will affect every single um, aspect of our lives, even in a way that we don't um, think about. See, AI is going to be much more subtle than we think. Think of electricity. Right now we're talking because someone, you know, Edison led up a light bulb. Uh, who could have imagined that electricity will lead to this? Mm -hmm. So basically, this is what AI is going to be, and it's going to happen in the next... Uh, I, don't, I don't think we have more than three years. I, I literally don't believe it's possible to have more than three years. So... What is going to happen first? It will change every single aspect of our lives in uh, unexpected ways. And it's not going to be this tangible. That's why I laugh every time when somebody is trying to plan 40% cut of their stuff. It means that they don't understand what's happening. Mm. They literally don't understand. This is not like buying a robot in the factory, replacing 20 workers. It's different, completely different. Mm. So yeah, the, the big difference is going to be the self-driving cars um, but it's not self-driving cars, it's robots on wheels. If you have robots on wheels, you have robots on legs. That means that uh, everything around you will be one way or another robotic. Think of all the, think uh, lonely people having someone to talk to all the time. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's this kind of stuff that's going to come first because they can happen immediately. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Great insights, very tangible, very original and kind of non-conventional. It's been an honor, Dobri.
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation.